Not a good day, and uh, looking for a good day on the Lord's Day. Well, if we were having pack a pew day, Miss Christine put it over the left field wall. Amen. I'm glad you're here. Your family loves you and supports you being here today. We're glad you're we're grateful you're here. But I want you to encourage you. Go out somewhere and you spend time with your family, and you enjoy the Lord's Day. Amen. This is the day. We celebrate where he got up from the grave. If you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 27, I'm not going to change my direction. I've been preaching here uh, just for a little while, Matthew chapter 27. And uh, somebody said, well, we ought to preach on the resurrection. Well, if you use the pastor, you can make that decision, amen, but you're not, amen. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey God. It's better to obey God rather than obey man, right, Amen. And so uh, it'll have a little bit to do with it, but uh, I want to encourage you. Let me say this also. Uh, I want to invite you to the revival. We'll be going in revival. Brother Scott Cottle will be preaching for us November the 13th through the 16th. That'll be Sunday morning through Wednesday night. And uh, for the invitation today, I want to share a song that he uh, wrote. He wrote this song, and we're going to use it for the invitation today. So you'll get a little chance to hear him. He'll be here preaching and singing when is that preacher? That's November the 13th through the 16th. Amen? And looking forward to that. All right, if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 27, Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want to preach to you this morning on the thought, the curse in the cry the curse and the cry. Father, we love you today. and We are grateful for your goodness to us. Thank you for, Lord, uh, not only going to the cross and shedding holy divine blood, but by the power of God, you raised yourself from the dead and ever liveth to make intercession for us. I thank you for these that are here this morning. Lord, for all of us that have been saved, I pray you'd encourage us through the message. But if there's some that's never been saved this morning, I pray today that they would pause to the, to the Spirit of God and turn in repentance and faith and ask Christ to come into their life and save them before it's too late. Be with us in this message. Uh, Lord, help us today to uh, make this day much about you. And uh, as we spend time with our family, I pray, Lord, we would put you first. And I promise you for all you do and for everything you'll accomplish We'll love you for it. Amen. We've been preaching on the cry of Calvary. The Lord, you know what has happened. Let me just bring some of you up to date. Maybe some of you have been able to watch on Facebook. By the way, I'd like to say welcome to our Facebook audience. You said, preacher, you look at Facebook. I do. I preach on Facebook. Amen. And a lot of people can hear it that can't be here this morning. A lot of elderly people. And so we try to take advantage of that situation. But I want to say welcome to them. We've been preaching this message. What has taken place is, of course, you're, you're aware of the old story. It never gets old, amen? Never gets old. They've taken our Lord and they've led him from Pilate's, uh, Pilate's judgment hall. They've beaten him with a cat of nine tails. Psalm 22 makes the statement, I may tell all my bones. They beat him to the point that the internal organs are now showing. They've took him to a place called Calvary, the skull, if you will, Golgotha. There the Roman soldiers have dig, digged a hole right out about two foot around and about eight foot deep. They've nailed him to a cross, raised that cross, dropped it up, and from the impact of that cross hitting the bottom of that hole, it dislocated every bone in the body of the Savior. Psalm 22 says it like this, all my bones are out of joint uh, from that impact. And so now the Lord is there, and just before he dies, he hurls out a cry along this line. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I want to continue that thought this morning. And I want to preach on the curse in the cry. If you have your Bible, Galatians chapter 3, if you would. Galatians chapter 3. We were there in Sunday school this morning. I'd like to pause and put a commercial there and invite you there. Uh, be in Sunday school if you can. Galatians chapter 3 this morning. And Paul comes along and he is referring to what Christ did at Calvary. Many people are not aware of all that took place at Calvary. But he starts out and he says he's going to teach you and I that the death of the cross, uh, the death of Christ on the cross was a curse. You say, what do you mean, preacher? 
That's what he's saying right here. Look at your Bible. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Now somebody say, what in the world would be that curse? Well, he tells us what it is. The curse, I personally believe, is being forsaken from Almighty God. Why hast thou forsaken me? You say, preacher, where do you read that at? Well, I'm glad you asked. Matthew chapter 25, just turn a few pages back. In Matthew chapter 25, one of the saddest chapters, I personally believe, that God has ever penned. It has to do when a man, woman, boy, or girl dies without Christ. You say, girl or boy, how old are you talking about, preacher? Well, when they, when they can comprehend and they have the mentality to understand right and wrong, uh, good and bad, when they know to do right and they do wrong, somebody, hey, did anybody ever have to teach you how to do wrong? Nobody here ever had to teach me how to do wrong. I was good at it, amen. I come by it naturally. Well, when we come to the age that we know right and wrong, there's a difference between them. We're, it's called the age of accountability, and I don't care who said it was 12. I don't believe them, amen. You, there's some children, I'll guarantee you, that are eight and nine years old that uh, know more about a computer than most of us in this building. Hey, man, they can do it. So God knows that, though, don't he? But there comes a time if a man, woman, or boy dies without Christ. The Bible said it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. We're all going to die unless Christ raptures the church first. But if we die without Christ, we're going to. this is the people that, that uh, the Lord is talking about in Matthew 25, in Matthew 25 and verse 41, Christ illustrates to you and I and proves to us what the curse is. The curse is being forsaken from God forever and ever and ever and ever. Many people talk about hell. Hell's going to be bad. If you die, there is a literal flame there. But the worst part of hell is being annihilated, banished from God forever and ever and ever and ever. And here's what the Lord Jesus is teaching you and I. The, the forsakening of God on an individual is a curse. Notice what, you, notice what your Bible says in verse 41 of chapter 25. Uh, he's got them here, and uh, some in Washington might want to read this, but anyway, you'll, you'll, if you'll read this in depth, that'll hit, it'll make sense tonight. Some of you tonight at midnight will read this. So, oh, that's what he was saying. Look in verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed. Ye cursed, you're cursed into everlasting life. In other words, God is going to curse man and forsake him or her forever and ever and ever and ever. The curse is being annihilated and banished from Almighty God forever and ever. That's what the Bible's teaching. Now I thought about this. When you look at this curse, this an uh, annihilation from God, God just literally, I don't know, somebody said, well, how's he going to do it? I don't know. How'd he create the moon? How'd he create the star? God stretched out the stars. God took the Grand Canyon, and with one scoop of his hand, friend, he created the Grand Canyon. I don't know how he'll do it, but he will. And here's what he's saying. When he forsakes a man, woman, boy, or girl, it is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And Jesus here is referring to him having taken the curse applied to his life to where you and I don't have to be forsaken. Now, when he said this, I thought about this. This exile, this banishing, if you will, it explains some things to me uh, in the Old Testament. Somebody said, oh, you read the Old Bible? Look, from Matthew, from Matthew, uh, excuse me, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 22, I believe every jot and every tittle. Somebody said, well, the Bible's filled with contradictions. It contradicts itself all the time. Bring me one page and I'll eat it publicly, okay? It, it doesn't happen. This is the only book that's been the bestseller forever. It's the only book that does not have any mistakes in it from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It is perfect. Somebody said, I disagree with that. Well, bring me the page and I'll eat it publicly on Facebook. The problem is I've made that challenge for years and nobody can ever bring me a mistake. If we have a perfect book that's written by a holy God 
Why would we not want to accept what it says? Well, look at here. In the Old Testament, the Lord is going to give us more than one illustration that's illustrating Calvary here. And he does it starting in the book of Leviticus. If you have that, if you have your Bible and would like to turn there, turn with me to Leviticus chapter 16. Now in Leviticus 16, as you're turning, God is going to talk about the, the sin offering. Leviticus chapter 16, and notice if you would, verse 27. Leviticus chapter 16, and what is taking place, there's what's called a bullock. Now this bullock is going to be offered for sin. In other words, uh, uh, if they're without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. I don't understand that about God. Well, you don't have to, but you better believe it. God said if you're going to give your sins forgiven, and I was going to have my sins forgiven, they're going to have to be an atonement, friend. There's going to have to be some blood shed. And in the Old Testament, under the Jewish law, they would take every year, and they would kill a bullock or a goat. Notice your Bible, verse 27 of Leviticus. And the bullock for the sin offering... And the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make an atonement, there's our word, the holy place, shall one, now watch this, after it's done, he said, after the blood of the bullet was sprinkled upon the mercy seat and upon the altar, once this bullet had been uh, killed and abused and its blood had been drained, you said, preacher, that's gory, that's the Bible. Once that happened, then this bullock, watch what you say, and the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought to make an atonement in the holy place shall one carry, watch this, forth without the camp and they shall burn in the fire their skins and their flesh and their dung. Here's what he's saying. First of all, keep in mind, in the nation of Israel, in the camp, in the center of the camp, was the tabernacle. That's where God Almighty dwelled. God was in the center of the camp. God told them, said, once this bullock is slain, once its blood is applied to the mercy seat, he said, I want you to take that bullock and you take that bullock's carcass, its dead carcass, and you banish it out of this camp. You take it outside the camp. You get it as far away from me as you can. God said the punishment on the bullock was the forsakening. Do you see that? It's in the text. Well, he gives another illustration. You don't have to turn here, uh, but I'll give you the reference. Maybe you want to look at it a little later. But for, for those of us that want to maybe read something a little later, Leviticus chapter 13 verse 46 is referring to the leper. Now all of us know you don't have to be in Sunday school long. You don't have to be in school long are in church long to know who the leper is. The leopard is filled with spots and uh, white hairs grow out of his arm. The leper is a beautiful picture, a perfect type of a man, woman, boy, girl who is filled with sin. Sin has embodied, has taken over their life. Now look here, don't look up at me at your self-righteousness and tell me this morning, well, I'm not a sinner. Yeah, you are, you just sinned because you're lying and said you wasn't a sinner. All of sin come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. I'm telling you from the pulpit to the back pew, friend, we are all sinners. All of us are sinners and all of us are saved by the grace of of Almighty God. If it wasn't for God, we'd die and go to a place called hell and be there forever and ever. But God, with His great mercy, wherewith He loved us, Christ loved us. And God gives a picture in Leviticus chapter 13, I believe it is, verse 46 of the leper. Now this leper Let's just turn there. We've got a minute. Let's just turn there because I want you to see something. In Leviticus chapter uh, 16, excuse me, 13, and verse 46, God is talking about this leper. And what he's saying is this. This leper, when he got this leprosy, he was to go outside the camp. Watch your Bible. Verse 46. And all the days that were in the plague shall be in him. He's talking about the leprosy. And he shall be alone. If you had this leprosy, you were alone. But watch this. And he shall dwell alone. Look here. 
Without the camp shall be his habitation. Here's what he's saying. The one that had the leprosy, God banished him. Outside of the camp, that leopard had to go outside the camp. He didn't have his mom with him. He didn't have his dad with him. None of his children, none of his family. He was banished outside the camp. Listen to the word of God. Leviticus chapters 13 verse 46. And he was left alone, the Bible says. Now what you see at Calvary in this cry is this. Here the Lord is at Calvary. And he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What you see at Calvary is this. From the eyes of Jehovah God, when he looked down at his son, he looked at him as the worst sinner who had ever walked on the face of this earth. I know Jesus never sinned. Don't, don't, you don't have to tell me that. But right here, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, listen to the Bible. For he, speaking of God the Father, hath made him sin for us who knew no sin. That leper outside of the gate, banished by God, was a picture of God's Son having the sin of the world laid upon him. And because my sin and your sin and the sin of the world was laid on the brow of the Lord Jesus, God forsook him. God turned his back on his son because of my sin and because of your sin. Now watch this. Here we are, we're going through life. No one ever had to teach us how to sin. It comes naturally. I promise you, some of you uh, were introduced to a magic parking lot a minute ago. Husbands and wives. They can fight and go back and forth with everyone, being mean and unkind to one another the whole time. After they've gotten dressed, they got, it's, it's sometimes it's work to come to church. You've got to get the kids ready. Now, my wife, thank God, she took that off of me. But uh, we've had our arguments. She lost. <laughs> but, but we figured out something back, back, back a while back is a magic parking lot. You know, people, they, they go back and forth with one another. We're getting out. We're running late. Let's go. And the time they hit the parking lot, poof, everybody's perfect. <laughs> Nobody's got any arguments. Everything, harmony, har instant harmony, buddy. Nobody had to teach us how to sin. It came naturally. Well, here's the message, and I'm finished. You know, if you run with me long enough and I run with you long enough, you're going to find out that I have my sin in my life and you have yours. And if you're sitting up here and you're saying, Preacher, I'm not a sinner, you're lying before God, all of us are. One man said this the other day. We were talking about, we were talking about a few individuals. And they said, well, he's better off than, he, 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 he's, he's a better person than this one. And I made the statement, I said, no, he's better off. And what I meant by that is this. You take a lost man, you take a saved man. Both of them have a problem with sin. The only difference, the only good thing about them is the saved man has dealt with his sin. The saved individual has dealt with their sin. They've done something with their sin. Did you know what? The Bible says be sure your sin will find you out. Did you know one time, eventually, we're going to have to appear before Almighty God. Everyone dies. Uh, no one avoids the judgment seat. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. God, we are going to appear before God. All of us are. Now here's the thought. You can appear alone or you can appear with the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus. When Christ, when Christ was judged of God at Calvary, Psalm 22, listen to what it says. He said, all of my bones are out of joint. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare at me, Christ said. He said, my heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. From the heat of God's judgment, the Lord Jesus, his heart melted. Now, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon made this statement. He said, if ever anyone could stand before the judgment of Christ, it certainly would be his son. 
the line of the tribe of Judah, the creator of this world. But when Jesus came before the judgment of God, his heart melted. Now, I've said all that to say this. Who in the world do we think we are? And we're going to come before God. And Romans, Paul said in Romans, but God who spared not his only son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he also not freely give us all things? If God didn't spare Jesus because of my sin, what do we think he's going to spare us for? Well, here's the thought, friend. I got good news. Listen to this. Nobody, 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 nobody has to die and go to hell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his only begotten son that we might be saved. Now here's the thought and I'm finished. When you look at Calvary, you look at the thorns upon the Lord Jesus' head. One doctor said they were approximately an inch and three quarters to two inches driven into the brow of the Son of God. Those thorns are an Old Testament symbol of sin. And the reason Jehovah God allowed them to take a crown of thorns and crown him, it was a symbolic meaning that the sin of the world had been placed upon the bullock of God, the Lamb of God, the, the sin of the world had been placed upon his brow. And what God was showing was this. I'm dealing with sin. I'm punishing sin. I'm punishing my son. Now all we have to do is this. You got two choices. If you die without him, you can take the punishment yourself. But if you die with him and accept, if you accept what he did at Calvary, if you look at Calvary and say, yeah, I got a sin problem. Preacher's right. I, nobody has to teach me how to do wrong. I don't want to die in my sin. Sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. I don't want to die and go to a place called hell. And for the first time, you realize Jesus is a picture of the bullock whose blood was shed, banished from the camp, the leper filled with sin, banished from the presence of God outside the camp where you and I could go free. Here's how simple it is, friend. What do I have to do to die and go to heaven? What do I got to do if, preacher, if I were to die, I wouldn't want to go, I wouldn't want to go to hell. God knows I don't want to go to hell. What, do I, what would I have to do? It's this simple. Have you, ever, have you ever seen someone walking down a sidewalk? Think about this. You're walking down a sidewalk. You've got your own mind made up about your destination. You're going where you want to go. If you're walking down that sidewalk, let's just say you're going downtown and you're going north and someone taps you on the shoulder, what's the first thing you do if someone behind you taps you? You turn around, right? That tap has caused you to turn directions, hasn't it? Now you're going this way. Here's what repentance is, friend. When you know you're lost and you know you need to be saved and you realize that without God you're going to die and go to hell, you're headed in your direction, you're stubborn as a mule and you know there's sin in your life and you don't want to deal with it and you're headed and the grace of Almighty God taps you on your shoulder. God's wanting you to turn from that way to Calvary. And you turn and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe you took the sin of this world. You took my sin at Calvary. And by faith, I'm willing to turn from my sin and invite you into my life. Come into my life and my heart and save me. I'll tell you like Shrek told Donkey. That'll do, Donkey. That'll do. I'm telling you, friend. Time is like a vapor. It's here and gone. I've had too many funerals, too many young funerals. COVID's took so many people. God, this morning, friend, by His grace, when most of the time you'd be laying in the bed, 
You'd be there somewhere else. God has moved and got you underneath the gospel. And he's not only tapping, he's hitting you with his hand. Turn before it's too late. Turn to my son. Give your life to my son. And today, friend, you need to come. I want you to stand with me if you would to your feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know we have little ones in here, and let me say I love them. Thank you for bringing your children. Matter of fact, we're going to be starting a children's ministry here very soon. Thank you for bringing your children. They've not, they've not disturbed one thing. God bless you for bringing your children. But as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, November 13th through the 16th, Brother Cottle will be here. Brother Scott Cotter wrote this song. I want to share it with you this morning. If you're here and you're lost and you need to come, I want you to leave your place. Maybe you're here and you know you're saved, but you've been away from God. You've been away from God and you need to get right with God. No one's going to question you. No one's going to embarrass you. If you want to come down here at this altar and kneel and say, Lord, I need to get right with you. I need you to help me. I need you to help me get serious about you. And whatever your need may be, as he begins to play this song, I want you to come. While no one's looking around, this is a private time. This is God's time. I want you to listen to the words of this song. You need to come. I want you to come. Please do that. Every time I'm blessed to see a flower spring up from a seed that's been planted in the earth at early spring every time i'm blessed to see the sunrise of another morning and hear the song the tiny bluebird sings listen now when i consider how god carved the mountains out with his own hand and painted them with colors of the woods. Nature in and of itself seems to share a message that reminds me that the God I serve is good. I'm reminded God is good. Even though I fail to thank Him, like I should I'm reminded that he cares when he hears and answers prayer and makes a way for me just like he said he would even when he sends the rain and my heart is filled with pain he'll be working all things for my good no matter if i'm basking in the sunlight on the mountain or walking through the valley god is good i think of my mother when i she died last year i think of this verse listen to this every time i'm blessed to feel the warm embrace of those I love and hear them tell me that they love me my heart is thrilled yet I'm reminded of a greater love extended from my God above when he sent his son to die on Calvary's hill oh the precious blood that Jesus shed that day had the power to wash my sin away Jesus did what no mortal man could yes, by laying down his sinless life he became the supreme sacrifice and that assures me that my God is good I'm reminded God is good even though I fail to thank Him like I should, I'm reminded that He cares.
gets when he hears and answers prayer and makes a way for me just like he said he would even when he sends the rain and my heart is filled with pain he'll be working all things for my good no matter if i'm basking in the sunlight on the mountain or walking through the valley god is good no matter if i'm basking in the sunlight on the mountain or walking through the valley God is good. Amen. All right, we're going to be dismissed just before we are. But just before we are dismissed, let me remind you, everything you give, 100% of it goes to the work of our church. And I want to tell you, if you got your mom here today, if you got your family, don't take them for granted. This little plug's for Miss Christine. Y'all love on her and take her somewhere to eat. I know y'all already going to do that, right? Uh, I, I, preacher, you didn't have to tell us that, but I knew you are going to do that. But just take her somewhere and love on her and somewhere to eat. Take her somewhere nice. Don't go to Burger King or <laughs> Arby's, uh, Taco Bell. You need me to pick for you, Miss Christine. <laughs> I'm teasing. I know they'll pick a good I know they're going to put you in a good spot. But before we do that, real quick, we're going to open the doors of our church. We've got a family want to join with us. And as they're coming, we're going to open the door. I have a motion. We open the doors of our church. Got a motion. Got a second. All right. Come on, Brother Dave. Uh, this is my son-in-law and my daughter. And uh, they're girls and young uh, little guy. It's, uh, I named them when they were little. One was uh, uh, Thunder. Thunder is this oldest one. Lightning is the middle one and hurricane's the bottom. And I love them. Now, they're not just coming here today to join our church. They're going to be taking over our children's ministry. So if you have young people, they're going to be instilling the Word of God in the lives of your young people. And the kids help them, okay? The young people help them. And so we, we're praying that God will give us a bus. And we, we're asking God to give us a bus. There's so many young children in this community that do not have mothers and fathers like you that will not bring them to the house of God, and we're burdened to go pick them up and get them in here. So do I have a motion we accept? They come by a statement of faith. Do I have a motion we accept this family in our fellowship? Got a motion, Brother Chuck. Do I have a second? Brother Paul, all in favor of making known by raising your right hand. Any opposed, like, sign. All right, let's be dismissed in the word of prayer. Right after prayer, if you would, you come around. I know COVID now. If, if you don't want to shake hands, it's okay, but if you want to come around and just maybe a fist bump or tell them hello, and uh, introduce them and tell them thank you for coming to the church. We'll do that. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. And Brother Marty, if you would, would you dismiss us, please? Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the day that this is, for the, for the opportunity that we have to know that you live and that you rose from the grave on the third day after being crucified and tormented on before Calvary, Lord. And I just thank you for that. I just pray that you'll be um, with us as we um, depart our ways this afternoon and bring us back this evening for um, another message to um, to be in your house, Lord, and just pray that you be with us all throughout this week, and um, thank you for having David and, um, and his family join the church today, and um, pray that you'll bless their ministry as they begin to um, minister to the children uh, that will be coming to our church and our community. Just in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.